Good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for this worship service this morning. If you would like a bulletin for this service, we're going to invite you to go to our website, www.enolacog.com, and click on the button there so that you can download the bulletin into your device or print it out for your use throughout this service. If you take a look at that bulletin now, you may take notice that today we are recognizing Compassion Sunday. We're going to talk about more about that a little bit later on in the service, but for now, let's talk about some of the announcements and things that are happening in the life of the church. So if you have that bulletin, we invite you to look on the last page at the uh, Sunshine Weekly, This Week in Enola. Today, we do have our children's lessons online. They're on Facebook at 9 and 9.30 a.m. If you're watching after that particular time, they should be on Sunshine TV. Those are for preschool and elementary students on Facebook. They uh, premiere at 9 and 9.30 a.m. respectively for preschool and for elementary students. Tell folks that may be coming to the sanctuary service today at 10.45 a.m. that they're welcome to join us in the sanctuary. If they're not comfortable coming into the sanctuary, we have designated places that they can go to and sit and listen to the service, or they can stay outside and stay in their cars or find a place in the property uh, to listen to the service on 89.9 FM on the radio. And let folks know that we have resumed kids' worship, and nursery during the 10.45 a.m. service, and we're so grateful for that. Tonight at 7 p.m., we have a prayer service. Tuesday at 10 a.m., Ladies' Bible Study is, is resuming in the Fellowship Hall. Ladies, come on out and be a part of that. Three teams are meeting Tuesday evening, Builders, Navigators, and Connectors. Builders at 6, Navigators at 6, and Connectors at 7 p.m., Wednesday at 7 p.m., we have our youth group, 412 Youth, and our adult Bible study. Youth are meeting outside, weather permitting, and the adults for Bible study will be in room number four. And if you want, you can join in on that at home where you are through Facebook Live. And at a later time, that particular video will be posted here on Sunshine TV. Friday night, we have a coffee house. And we're going to have Jimmy Jet and the Sky Pilots. Those guys are a hoot. You don't want to miss that. But we do ask that if you're going to bring food items to donate, please do not bring homemade food items because of the pandemic. Uh, we're not uh, doing that at this time. But you can bring prepackaged uh, store-bought items to share. That would be perfectly fine and appreciated. On Saturday, we have our family scavenger hunt for families with children at 10 a.m. That'll go from 10 to 11.30 a.m. And get this, the youth group is going to be camping out. Yeah, here on the church property, 6.30 p.m. They're having a lock-in camp out uh, all night long, Saturday into early Sunday morning. Let the youth know about that. And next Sunday, we have pretty much a regular schedule. I believe those are all the announcements pertinent for this morning, so we're going to begin our service this morning by listening to the prelude. This morning's call to worship is taken from Psalm 97, verses 1 through 2. We invite you now to give your attention to the reading of God's word. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne.
Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today that you are the God who reigns. Father, we pray today that you would reign in our hearts as we worship you today in spirit and in truth. Help us to put aside those thoughts, those concerns, those anxious thoughts that weigh us down so that we can totally and freely focus on you. May this service be for you and unto you. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me now in singing, Stand Up and Bless the Lord. from Compassion International, and the second one will have a testimony and a word of encouragement from our very own ECOG's very own Jeff Lynch. I'm Candace Cameron Bure, and I am in Santiago in the Dominican Republic. I'm on my very first trip with Compassion, and we're visiting a few of the projects um, that have the CSP, the Child Survival Program. I've known about Compassion, obviously, for a long time, but I've never experienced what Compassion does for myself. We are very passionate about this organization. Uh, we found out through our church in Fort Lauderdale, and we fell in love with the organization and what they do. I knew some level of the expectation of poverty, but I, I had no idea what compassion really does. It's a necessity for all these moms because, because they really don't have the knowledge of how to care for themselves, how to care for their baby. They're getting one-on-one -on -one attention from another woman that has the experience that just wants to love on them and give them the support that they need to say everything's gonna be good, you can get you can get through this to pray with them and what their needs are, but really give them an emotional comfort. The thing that's impacted me the most on this trip is the first home visit that we went to. We, we met a girl that has a four kids, and I, I'm assuming they were all under four or five years old, and she lost two of them. They opened up the Bible to start in prayer, and God's Word just melted my heart in there. And all I could think about at, the, at that moment is that I go out and I share the gospel with thousands of people when I speak and I share my testimony. And yet I stood in her home and I thought to myself, this is the gospel. 
this is the gospel right now. I'm standing in it. I'm living in it. This is what compassion is all about, helping kids, helping people, biblically explaining to them that God loves them. So for us, it couldn't be any better organization that represents of what we love and what our family stands for. I'm going home with a completely new enthusiasm and perspective, and I just felt so privileged that God has given me the opportunity to do that and experience that with my family, and it's just an amazing organization, but it's, you know, a mighty God that we serve, and truly it's God softening our hearts and exposing us to different ways of life and, and the needs of the world, and, um, you know, it just, it just humbles me to the core. Think about the uncertainty, the stress, the fear that you and your family are experiencing during the pandemic. Now try to imagine what life would be like if you were lived in extreme poverty right now as well. Worldwide, there are 385 million children living right now in extreme poverty. 81 million school-aged kids don't attend school. Around 45% of all children's deaths are related to malnutrition and 2.1 billion people don't have safe drinking water. Imagine the day in the life of one of these children, many children. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused enormous problems. Parents can't work, they can't provide food, and so hunger is increasing worldwide. Limited water for drinking and hygiene, healthcare is extremely scarce. Dangerous conditions too, as people become desperate, security and safety are enormous concerns for families. And dysfunctional families with mental illness and drug abuse and sexual abuse, sadly, is very common. Relationships are stressed. Security and hope that children need is often missing. Here's why my wife and I are sponsors. When our son was young, we stepped out in faith and sponsored a boy named Batuli from the Congo. He was about the same age as our son, and as a family, we would delight in writing letters back and forth. The boys would draw pictures for each other. Batuli even referred to our son as his brother. We still look at his scrapbook from time to time. When Batuli aged out of the program, we sponsored another child, then another, each time engaging with them with letters and stories, praying for them always. We currently sponsor a young girl in Ethiopia named Sifan, our fourth child. She'll be 10 in December. And most importantly, we felt that God would be pleased that we would take him at his, his word to heart when he says in Psalm 82, three, defend the weak and the fatherless, uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. And in Proverbs 31, eight, which says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for rights, of all who are destitute. There's never been a greater time of need for these children. Here's how you can help. First, pray for these children and for their families and for their countries. Pray for them. Next, if you visit the living room, Jeff and Bowden will have a number of children to sponsor right away. You can review the information for each child and uh, which will include the um, age and the gender and their home country. And pray that God will open your heart as you make a selection. As a brand new way to sponsor, and because the need is so urgent, Compassion has a text option. The number will appear on the screen. Simply text the word sponsor now to the number on the screen behind me. And once you send the text, one child will be sent to you immediately. This child is only being sent to you. Follow the link that's being sent and all the necessary information for sponsorship and payment information. Submit your sponsorship information and receive the confirmation page or email. 
If you do not sponsor, a, or if you do not sponsor, a follow-up text reminder is sent in 24 hours. And finally, if you're just not sure you're ready to sponsor a child, flyers will also be available out in the living room, which will direct you to more information. The need has never been so great. For a mere $38 per month, you can change a child's life with your sponsorship, with your love, and with your prayers. Please consider sponsoring today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for those encouraging words to us to encourage us to consider Compassion International. And remember, those of you, because of course you're watching this at home, you can't go look at a sponsor child in the living room lobby or anywhere else today, but you are welcome to text to that number that you see behind me. You feel free to do that if God is so leading you. For our offering moment, we'll be sharing Psalm 54, verses 6 and 7, which reminds us, With a free will offering I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. We want to thank those of you that continue to be faithful to mail your tithes and offerings to the church or set up your bill payment uh, option to do that. Or some of you come by and drop them in the offering boxes. Uh, thank you for continuing to worship God through the giving of tithes and offerings. And thank you for your acts of generosity in various ways that you've served to be Jesus' hands and his, his voice and his feet in his world, offering a cup of cold water in his name. And we want to thank those of you that do things like sponsoring children through Compassion International and other ways uh, to bless uh, the least of these in Jesus' name. Let's keep up those acts of generosity and worshiping God by giving him his tithes and offerings that he deserves. Will you now join me in a word of prayer over our offering and our acts of generosity? God, we thank you that you are a compassionate and generous God towards us. We would pray now that you would help us to be likewise uh, to those that Jesus has told us to be compassionate towards, to bless and to offer a cup of cold water in his name. And Lord, we worship you too with those tithes and offerings that you surely do deserve. We pray that you would accept them and multiply them in ways that people will be reached with the gospel message and more souls added to the kingdom of God. And we ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you join me now in singing, Break Thou the Bread of Life?
let's take this opportunity now to go to the Lord in prayer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, it is a wonderful thing to be in your presence today. The one true, just, and holy God. Heavenly Father, here is our pres in your presence, though, we are reminded that we do not copy you like we should. We do not often always strive for holiness or strive to follow your ways. We, in fact, think that our ways sometimes are better than your ways. And we wander off the path. We sin and do what grieves you. So for the times in this past week that we have done just that, we ask you to forgive us. At this time, let us silently acknowledge our sins and confess them to the Lord. God, we thank you for your forgiveness. And we claim those words of assurance of pardon from your word, that though our sins be as scarlet, you wash them whiter than snow. We thank you. Father, today it is with great concern that we lift to you the state of this world and this nation, asking your Holy Spirit to move this world away from sin and in the direction towards you. And by all means, use us through our hands, our voices, and our feet to be your ambassadors to show the world a better way. Lord, regarding our own, we pray for those here today that are struggling in various ways with needs, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, financial needs. Lord, the whole ball of wax, we just take it and put it into your care, into your hand, just knowing that you have a plan and we ask you to, to work it out, to answer people's prayers according to your will and your way, and we're going to trust you as you do that. God, we also want to pray for the work of your church around the world, here and abroad. We pray, Lord, for every place where Jesus is truly proclaimed. And we pray, Lord, for those other groups that are connected with your kingdom and your church, such as Compassion International. Lord, we pray that you would bless this ministry and bless those that participate in with it. God, we want to pray as well today for an increase to your kingdom, that there would be even more people who hear the wooing of the Spirit and surrender their lives to Jesus. And until they do that, Father, we just pray that they would not feel comfortable in their current path, but they couldn't help but want to get away from that road that leads to destruction and surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus. At this time, let us silently lift to the Lord the names of people who need Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Thank you, Father, for speaking to these individuals through your Holy Spirit. We can't wait to see a harvest. Father, we just want to pray now for this church that we would continue to be your lighthouse, guiding people to salvation and preparing people to face the storms of life. Lord, regarding those storms, we pray for those that are facing that terrible aftermath of a storm that yet hit in the Gulf Coast again. Father, as you may call us to be a blessing to others and to pray for them, and even perhaps some may feel called to go there, may we obey your call to be a blessing to others. That's what we pray for. Now we ask for your word to mold us and make us and challenge us and call us into the kinds of people that you call us to be. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. He was standing in line at the pharmacy to buy a tube of cream. Now, I guess I'll tell you that this cream was the same stuff that's in Preparation H. Sorry if that's too much information for you. But he was standing there, and apparently he didn't like standing in line very well, waiting to pay for his tube of cream. In front of him, there were two little old ladies gabbing away, and in front of them there was a caregiver that had a teenager who was in a wheelchair. And at the very front of the line was a young expecting mother trying to pay for her bill. And so he waited and waited and waited, and finally he had enough. He grew impatient. He walked up to the front, walked in front of that young expecting mother, slammed the tube of cream down on the counter, and demanded that he be waited on right there and then. Well, this caused quite a stir. Those two little old ladies, if you will, took that guy and started to chew him out. 
And oh, they went on and on and on. And as they did, his hands started to shake and his knees quivered and even his lips quivered. And finally, he looked at those two ladies and he said, you can't tell me what to do. You're not my mother. And he slammed the tube of cream down and he stormed out of the storm. Now, I don't know about you, but I would call someone like that a very immature person. Now, to be honest with you, if you look a little more into this guy's life, he was 60 years old and he was a college professor, it was reported. But just because he had life experience and just because he had a lot of smarts, that didn't guarantee that he was a very mature person, did it? No, no, no. One of the card greeting card companies had a birthday card out several years ago that you could buy and send to someone that says this, and I quote, you're only young once, but you can be immature forever. That's true. That's true. And by the way, that story about this guy, Mr. Preparation H, if that's what you want to call him, the story was reported by that young expecting mother standing in line there in front of him. She wrote about it on an internet blog dedicated to stories about immature people. There you go. We continue to work our way through the message series, The Christian Life, Shallow Versus Deep. We introduced this concept back on Labor Day weekend, and last weekend we started focusing on the shallow life, and that's what we're going to do today. Messages that we're looking at, what does the Christian's, uh, Christian shallow life, what does that consist of, so that we can identify and know how to deal with it. And then after we're through all those messages, we're going to talk about the deeper life, and the goal is to move from shallow to deep. That's my goal. I hope that's your goal as well. But I would venture to say today that one of the things that is a clear mark of someone living a shallow Christian life is something that I'm going to call spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity. I'm out on a limb here because those words spiritual immaturity do not appear in today's passage. No, no, no. They are not there. But I'm hoping that as we look at this passage, especially as we get to the end, we'll understand more clearly that, yep, spiritual immaturity yeah, that's the mark of a shallow Christian life. And what's one main aspect? What does the spiritually immature person look like? Well, there's a number of things that are a part of a spiritually immature person, but today we're gonna to focus on the person who says this. The Holy Spirit is calling them, the Holy Spirit is convicting them, the Holy Spirit is trying to do a work in that Christian's life, but that Christian looks back at the Holy Spirit and says, oh no, he can't tell me what to do. That's spiritual immaturity, and it's part of the shallow Christian life. Let's look at our scripture passage now. It's taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 12. We're going to invite you to follow along in your own Bibles. You can call it up on a phone or a tablet or simply listen. We'll be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 12. And these words were penned by the Apostle Paul, but inspired by the Holy Spirit. Let's begin reading at verse 5. Paul says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if in fact the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And listen to this now, verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And there ends our lesson. 
Let's kick things off today with a little review. Let's remember the difference between a shallow versus the deep Christian life. And I'm going to give you some diagrams that show up much better when I get out of the way. So I'm going to do that now. This diagram, if you will, shows two pictures here of the battle that goes on in each and every believer's mind. Remember, we as believers live in these bodies with a sinful nature, the flesh, if you will. And we make decisions with our minds. We also have the Holy Spirit who's living inside of us. On the left, you see here a decision that was made in the mind to listen to the Holy Spirit. We can do that. We can listen to what God's Spirit is telling us. That's a good thing. But as you see from the diagram on the other side, on the right, those bodies, the, the, the mind, excuse me, living in these sinful bodies can also listen to the flesh, listen to the sinful nature and ignore the Holy Spirit. And it's a battle inside of us each and every day. Who are we going to listen to? Which way is it going to be in our minds? Listening to the Holy Spirit or listening and obeying the works of the flesh? Now, here is where spiritual immaturity and spirit, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the spiritually shallow life versus the spiritually deeper life uh, comes into play. The shallow life looks like this, where in the mind we spend a lot of time listening to and giving too much attention to the works of the flesh and less attention to the spirit. But that's not our goal, is it? What we want to see happen in us as we grow in the Lord is this. We want to see where there's more time given in our minds to the Holy Spirit and less time when we're listening to the flesh and even more so that the dominant thing is the Holy Spirit in us, in our minds, we're listening to the Spirit and less and less and less we're paying attention to those acts of the flesh in our sinful nature. That's it. That's the shallow versus the deeper life and the desire that I hope you want and that I want to go deeper. So speaking of the spiritually shallow, if you will, the spiritual life that is a shallow walk, what we're going to do is we're going to begin today by taking a look at the difference between those who are spiritually dead and spiritually alive. Not those who are necessarily shallow versus those who are deep, but Paul is going to begin today by talking about those who are spiritually dead versus those who are spiritually alive. Why is he talking about that? to build an argument that we need to hear today. So bear with us as we look at the argument. Again, we're going to make use of diagrams, if you will. And for these, I think I can just stand off to the side so that you can see me talk because these diagrams show up a little bit better than the others do. But let's begin by looking at verse five in our text. There are those who live according to the flesh. That's what Paul says. This isn't the Christian who is indwelt by the Holy Spirit who makes the wrong choice in the battle of his mind to listen to the flesh. No, we're talking about people who live all the time according to the flesh. It's noted there by the diagram that you see on the left. You see that the mind and the old inner nature without the Holy Spirit and the flesh are all one, living totally and completely according to the flesh. The life is all about the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. This represents the unsaved, the unforgiven, and the unredeemed person. That's what this is all about. Now, uh, according to verse 6, how do we know that they are the unsaved and not just Christians who slipped up? Well, because verse 6 says that to set the mind on the flesh is death. In other words, they're already dead. They're dead, spiritually speaking. But, verse 5, those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. These are the saved. These are the forgiven, the redeemed. Noted by the diagram that you see on the right. The Holy Spirit lives inside of the believer. And yes, even though the believer lives in the flesh, in the mind, the Holy Spirit can listen or the mind can listen, excuse me, to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6 says that to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So I hope that realizing, as we realize from what Paul is saying, that the life in the Holy Spirit as a believer is life and peace. But that other way, all according to the flesh, is death. There is a big difference. There's a big difference between the two. 
And to give us a little bit more of a taste about how big this big difference is, look at verses 7 and 8. Verse 7, because the mind is set on the flesh, always all about the flesh, it can't even, even it can't even, it won't, not only will it not, it cannot submit to God's law. It's incapable of submitting to God's law. And verse 8, because it can't do that, it can't please God. What a sorry state of affairs it is to be in that state, not knowing Christ, living in the flesh, not having the Holy Spirit. Can't even please God. It's a mess. Big difference between the two. A big difference between those who are spiritually alive versus those who are spiritually dead. But here's the good news for Christians, for us. Here's the good news. According to verse 9, and I'll use diagrams again, if you are a believer, God's Spirit lives in you. You see that old flesh and mind and inner nature all in cahoots, that diagram you see on the left? That's not a Christian. We're going to put a big X through it. If you're a believer, that's not you. That's not you. If you're a believer, God's Spirit lives in you. You represent that diagram on the right, or that diagram, rather, represents you. It's those who don't belong to the Spirit of Christ that don't belong to Him. It's the unsaved, the unforgiven, the unredeemed, but it's not us. Verse 10 says, the body, though, that we live in as believers, yes, using the diagram of us, you see there, it's dead. See, the flesh is still dead. The forces of death are at work in the flesh. The lusts of the flesh abide in the body, and it's a dying body, and we constantly face those deadly forces in our flesh. In other words, the redeemed soul has to live in a body of flesh with a fallen nature. It's a warehouse of sin and sinful desires. The flesh is a powerful force in our mortal bodies that tempts us and entices us to do what is wrong. That's why as Christians, you can see from the diagram there, that's why we still sin. Yes, in our mind, we can listen to the Holy Spirit, but again, we can listen to the flesh. In his book, The Promise, Experiencing God's Greatest Gift, Dr. Tony Evans says this, and I can't say it like he says it. He says, the Holy Spirit is like the structure of a house that has been eaten up by termites. You can paint the inside, put down new carpet, and buy new furniture, but you have not fixed the structural problem. The flesh is like a bad in-law. You can't get rid of it. It just keeps hanging around. Yep. Our sinful bodies are centers of sinful desires, emotional depression, and spiritual doubts. But back to verse 10. The Spirit is alive. That's the good news because of righteousness. The Holy Spirit of God lives in us. Therefore, our spirits are alive. Yes, the flesh is like that broken down old house that you can't fix up with a coat of paint and all those kinds of things that Dr. Evans mentioned. But the Holy Spirit has been credited to us and is living inside of us. And if you can't appreciate that and don't realize how powerful it is, look at verse 11. Paul reminds us that same spirit who lives in us is the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. Have you heard Jeremy Camp's song, Same Power? The same power that rose Jesus from the grave lives in us. I don't think Jeremy spouted that off from the top of his head. It's right here in Scripture. And because that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in us, our mortal bodies are going to be raised into a new likeness at his resurrection, in the likeness of his resurrection, excuse me, just like he was in his resurrection. That's going to happen someday. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 55 make this clear. Paul, writing this passage as well, says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all change, be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, 
Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? That's why it's a big deal that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. It's not about death. It's not about those holy, the, the, the thing where the, the Holy Spirit is absent and therefore the mind and the inner nature and the flesh, they're all co in cahoots, just in a, in, a, in a death sentence, if you will. But rather, it's the same spirit living in us that raised Jesus from the dead, making it possible that someday, yeah, we're going to have new bodies and we're going to live eternally as well. That's the spirit that's living in us. It's incredible. Now, having said that, having said that, and there's the passage, by the way, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 55, if you want to look it up. Having said that, keep this in mind. Because of God's blessings and all that is at stake, believers have an obligation to the spirit. The obligation is not to the flesh. Therefore, by implication, he says that. We are not debtors to the flesh, but to the spirit. The actual word used, I believe, is debtor. It means actually a financial debt, a debt, an obligation of a financial nature, meaning that we owe it not to the flesh, but we owe it to follow the Holy Spirit. That's what we owe as believers, not to the flesh. We owe the spirit our attention. We owe it to the spirit to obey the spirit's call. And in fact, this is what I would say today, and I'm out on a limb, but I believe it's true. To forget, ignore, or dislike this obligation is an example of spiritual immaturity. Spiritual immaturity. Now, why am I out on a limb? Well, other pieces of scripture look at spiritual immaturity maybe in a different way. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul mentions those immature, those infants of the faith who are carnal or fleshly Christians, if you will, people of the flesh. They still need milk. Um, they're not ready for the solid meat of the word of God. And the writer of Hebrews echoes this in Hebrews 5 as well. Paul also, also talks in Ephesians 4.14 4, about infants who are spiritually immature and are tossed about by various winds of doctrine, not knowing exactly what to believe. So knowing that's the case, why would I then set out on a limb and say that those Christians who aren't serious about their obligation to follow the Spirit are immature? Well, let's take the Old Testament prophet Jonah. He's recognized as an Old Testament follower of God who was very immature in his spirit. He doesn't want to go preach at a place called Nineveh. Oh, if he eventually does after be, being swallowed up by a big fish and learning a very tough lesson, then he finally goes and he listens and he starts to preach. But then as the people there at Nineveh are convicted and are, are listening and, and starting to turn towards God, he doesn't like it. He doesn't want God to be compassionate towards the Ninevites. So he's mad again. That great prince of preachers, C.H. Spurgeon, wrote about Jonah's immature spirit when he said, Jonah is like a little child going back to kindergarten. This childlike spirit of Jonah had to go to kindergarten because he needed to be taught by object lessons. <laughs> by the way, those object lessons were tough object lessons. The big fish being swallowed up by the big fish, the vine, the worm, the scorching wind, you read the story if you don't remember it. You'll see those childish or childlike object lessons where Jonah needed to learn the hard way. And think about the analogy that we used last week from the life of Jesus and his healing ministry. Remember what we said? Jesus encountered a man in the synagogue that his hand was withered. It didn't work. And, and it was impossible for this man, after years and years, to do anything. He couldn't get his hand to move, but Jesus healed him. But then he commanded the man, stretch out your hand. And that man had an obligation to obey Jesus so that the healing could finally be consummated and happen the way Jesus wanted it to. He obeyed and he was healed. The same goes true for that guy who was paralyzed for 38 years. 
He couldn't make himself get up and walk. He couldn't do it. But when Jesus healed him, and then Jesus said, get up, take your mat, and get walking, he had an obligation to get up, take his mat, and take a walk. That's the obligation. Imagine, if you can, these guys saying, no. That's a good comparison to saying no to the obligation to live and to listen according to the Holy Spirit. It's immature to look to the Holy Spirit and say, no. Why in the world would a believer want to say, oh no, he can't tell me what to do to the Holy Spirit. So in closing today, do you desire a deeper walk with God, but find that you're still stuck living the Christian shallow life? It could be for a number of reasons, but could it be because the Holy Spirit is calling you and convicting you about a particular area of your life, but you find yourself saying no to the Holy Spirit? You see, we say no to the Spirit, when we keep back a part of ourselves and refuse to surrender that part completely to him. We say no to the Holy Spirit when he reminds us of an area of our life that he's working to clean up in our lives and he wants us to cooperate with him, but we ignore him or we say no. We say no to the Holy Spirit when he calls us to minister, to do something in Jesus' name, and we just say no, it could be anything. One example might be is if God calls someone to get involved with Compassion International, and I'm not using that as a way to coax you here today to do that, not at all. The point is, is when we say no, even to the calling of God in our heart to bless someone when God's calling us, that's spiritual immaturity. The list of things that we say no to, to the Holy Spirit, it goes on and on and on. But just remember, when we say no, we are ignoring or disliking an obligation or forgetting about it, an obligation that we have, not to the flesh, but to the Holy Spirit. In lieu of all that the Spirit has blessed us with, and in lieu of how much trouble we can get ourselves into with the flesh that's opposed to the Holy Spirit, and knowing how much better it is to walk in the spirit, and how horrible it is to walk in the flesh. Why in the world would we not want to fulfill our obligation to the spirit? To forget, ignore, dislike, any of that. Our obligation to the Holy Spirit is a kind of spiritual immaturity that keeps our walk with God shallow. But hopefully, you and I, we don't want a shallow life. We want a deeper life. That being so, let's keep in step with the Holy Spirit by freely carrying out our obligation to yield to Him. And let's keep in mind, it's never, ever, ever a good time to act like a spiritually immature person and say to the Holy Spirit, Oh no, He can't tell me what to do. Amen and amen. Will you join me now in singing, Jesus is Lord of all.
will you now receive the benediction? Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks for the gift of your precious Holy Spirit. Father, I just pray for a, for a reminder and, and for a conviction for each and every one of us to not say no to your Holy Spirit, but to say yes to the obligation to listen to him. Father, thank you for delivering us from that state of affairs, that, that life of living totally and completely in the flesh. And thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Help us to listen to him. Grant us, Heavenly Father, a deeper walk with you. And we ask all of these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today for this worship service for Compassion Sunday. Keep in mind one more time, if you haven't seen the number yet, you can text to the number there if you would like to get involved by sponsoring a child through Compassion. This concludes our morning worship service. Be blessed.